One of the things I just love about Saturday night is the blinding lights. <laughs> we don't have those during the day. I don't know really why we need them at night, but anyway. Um, one of the things about Oxford House that is amazing is when you meet that person and you see things in them um, and they end up inspiring you. Uh, the person that is speaking tonight is one of those people. But I met her through another individual, and so I've asked him to come up tonight and to introduce her. her. Marty? My name's Marty, I'm an addict, long-term recovery. What that means to me is everything. I haven't put any substances in my body since March 15th of 1998, and for that I'm truly grateful. What a special evening this is. And what an honor that I have tonight is to be able to introduce one of the most, let me back up. I met a girl <laughs> at a world convention in D.C. Said, well, who came from Kenner, the Kenner house? Because I was looking for the troublemakers that were supposed to come so I could make sure that they made it. But they sent this other lady instead. And so I went up and I, I introduced myself. And she's looking at me like, I said, my name's Marty. She's like, I'm Lori. I said, are you in the Kenner House? He says, yes. I said, well, welcome. Is this your first convention? She says, yes. I said, if there's anything you need, please let me know. And so I kind of, as outreach workers, we kind of have to see where people are at. I mean, we have to kind of watch because this house had been trouble for years, freaking years. It was open in 2001, and this was 2007, and they still hadn't paid their loan back. <laughs> so this is, you can see what I'm dealing with, so I'm trying to, I'm trying to gauge it. And, but I see this lady, she's doing nothing but paying attention. She's paying attention to everything that's going on, unlike the other members of the house. So... Uh, we at, at this point in Louisiana, we started having investors call. It's like, do you want to open a house, blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking, let me go ask her. And so I drove over. To, she was over at another friend's house. And I called her and I said, are you there at the house? She said, yeah. And I said, I'm going to be over there in 10 minutes. I didn't tell her why. You never, outreach workers should never say why I'm coming because then they leave, you know. <laughs> I said, I'll be over there in about 10 minutes. And uh, I showed up and I asked her, I said, would you be interested in opening this house? I have an opportunity to get this house. Would you be interested? Now, it's across the lake. It's like 40 miles away. It's from Metairie to Mandeville. But it's a beautiful house, Rega uh, regalia, right? And uh, she said, yeah, I'll do let me talk to my sponsor and I'll, and, and I'll give you an answer tomorrow. She called me the next day and she says, yes, I want to do that. We need a women's house in Mandeville. There is no women's houses. And I'll transfer my job and I'll move over there. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> score. And then about a month later, I had another investor in, 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 in Slidell and say, hey, you want to get this house? And I'm like, hey, Lori. She's like, yes, we need a, a women's house in Slidell. I'll move over there and transfer my job. We need a women's house over there. And she went back and, and opened that house, too, a month later. And then about a month later, 
hey, we might be able to get this house in Mandeville again, uh, where you just came from. I'm sorry, but would you? Yes, yes. And it just kept going on. It's like, I need to get out of this girl's way. She's like, we, we need a women's house over here. There's not enough women's houses. It's all men's houses. We need women's houses every freaking where. And when I tell you, like, she would be mad at me. It's like, we're going to, when, when are we getting another women's house? Another women's house. Lord, um, this went on, and it's like, you know, you meet people, and, like, I remember one time I went over to her, because we would hang out, we would laugh and cut up, and, you know, and then it's like, when are we getting another women's house? And I remember we were going to, she found a house in freaking Kenner. We're in Slidell cutting up at e And she's like, hey, let's go look at this house in Kenner. It's 5 o'clock freaking traffic in New Orleans. Now, if you've ever had to drive from Slidell to Kenner in 5 o'clock traffic, it ain't fun. And I'm like, Lori, this house is only a, like a, a one bedroom, you know. And she, you know, 800 square feet. And I'm like, it's not going to work. She's like, I just want to go look. I just want to go look. I mean, that's the kind of, that's the kind of freaking uh, person she was it's like, we need a women's house, Kenner, another one. But it's like, Lori, it's not going to work. And she was like, I just want, I don't want to, Lori, I don't want to drive in five o'clock traffic to go look at a house. It's not going to work. She was so mad at me. She was freaking mad at me for like two days, you know? Because she was just on fire. I mean, and she would transfer her job. She would relocate. It didn't matter where. And this is like, it's so rare. It's, that's so rare. So um, I believe that she got hired shortly thereafter and went to Oklahoma. You know? And it's been an amazing journey just watching this flower bloom. And uh, I mean... There's a, the there redwoods and sequoias are the tallest trees in the world. And I learned this from my coworker, Miles Davis, or not Miles Davis, Miles Taylor. <laughs> Miles Taylor. The, the redwoods and sequoias are the tallest trees in the world, but the way they get there, they don't get there on their own. They don't, they don't, they can't do it. They have to grow in forests. And when a sequoia or a redwood starts to grow, what it does is its roots start reaching out to find the other ones. And they link together. And then they can grow hundreds of feet high. And then when they get up there, the branches at the top start linking together too. And that's how they get so big. They can't do it on their own, but together they can become the, the strongest trees in the world. So let's welcome one of the strongest trees of Oxford House, Lori Holdsclaw. <laughs> Good evening, my beautiful family. So I'm a quite emotional speaker, and he's already got me crying. I haven't even said anything yet. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so, um... I was going to tell that story about coming to, when I met Marty, you know, come to my first convention. I was a month and a half out of jail. I, had, I hadn't flown on a plane since I was like 17 years old. And my roommates told me, they said, if you see a guy named Marty Walker, you stay away from him. <laughs> I said, okay, I got you. I got you, girl. So that was in September of 2007. In December of 2007, I picked up my one year, and somehow Marty knew about that. I don't know. We didn't, I didn't have Facebook back then, but he found out about it, and he called me, and he said, I'd like to go with you to a meeting to pick up your one-year chip, and I'm like, really? 
but he must like me. <laughs> he was really trying to find out what I was about so he could talk me into opening Oxford houses for him. And it worked. Thank you, Marty. It's been an amazing journey, and I, I really do owe it all to you. He's seen something in me that I didn't see in myself, and, uh, and that's what we do here, right? We see something in other people, and we bring the good out of them. So, seems like there's a lot of pressure tonight. <laughs> um, if I'm not mistaken, am I the first female speaker? for Saturday night. <laughs> I have Paul watching me on TV. I know he's critiquing me. So, hello, Mr. Malloy. But one thing I do know about myself is that I work really, really well under pressure. And the week leading up to me coming here has been absolutely insane. There was a big giant hurricane that pretty much took out the bottom of Louisiana. We had 110 people here scheduled to come fly out on Wednesday, and only half of them made it, so I'd like to give a shout out to my Louisiana people. <laughs> they're usually in a much better mood, and they're usually a lot more peppy, um, but I think they just come on this trip so they would have air conditioner and shower. <laughs> They had to drive to Houston to get on the plane to get here because all the flights got canceled. So my name is Lori and I'm in long-term recovery and my sobriety date is December 20th of 2006. <laughs> I am a grateful member of Alcoholics Anonymous. So I, my name is Lori and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> I'll tell you a little bit about my background. Um, I grew up in a very small town called Bogalusa, Louisiana. <laughs> it's a population of about 12,000 people, and it is very, very rural. And um, um, I grew up in an alcoholic home. My father was an alcoholic. My mother probably should have been an Al-Anon. Um, and there was a lot of you know, physical abuse that I endured through my childhood from my father. Now, I loved my daddy, um, and I think he just did the best he knew how. And, you know, I believe that abuse comes from cycles of abuse. And so he just did what he knew, you know, like how he was taught. And so that just kind of, it was just a cycle that I went through with him. And um, so, and, and there was always alcohol in the house. There was always like a rowdy bunch of people around. Um, and it was just, it was, it was like whenever I was young, the, the thing that I remember the most about my childhood is being fearful. Like I lived in fear. Um, I was scared that he was going to hit me. I was scared that he wasn't going to love me. I was scared that, you know, that he was going to reject me. And, um, and so I carried that fear with me everywhere I went and all the way into my adult years. Um, I remember my first boyfriend, Alex, my son Alex's father, Chad. Um, we started dating when we were very young, 15, 14, 15 years old. And I remember that, um, that we used to be very volatile to each other because that's what I knew as what love was, right? Um, so obviously that didn't work out, but we did have an amazing son. Uh, his name is Alex, and he is 26 years old now. Um, he's a wonderful, wonderful kid, and he's very handsome, and all the ladies tell me. LAUGHTER um, so I took my first drink when I was uh, probably in like the fifth grade. Um, the only thing I remember about it is that I got in trouble. Uh, I was at a, my slumber party and my sister brought it and we all got drunk and somebody called their mom and we just got in a bunch of trouble, got punished. Um, I started using outside issues 
you know, al drugs whenever I was in high school, probably junior high, high school. Um, and it didn't really affect me too, too much, but I always had the behaviors, always. Um, when I was 17, I graduated from high school when I was 17, and shortly thereafter, I got pregnant with Alex. And that's the only nine months of my, from the age of 13 to 30, that I did not use alcohol or drugs. Um, I had Alex, and my parents were still alive at that time, and they loved to take care of kids. And I wanted to go out and party, so I would leave Alex with them, you know, and I would go out six, seven, six, seven days a week. I would go out and I would party. And um, it's around that time that I started using some really hard drugs, and it wasn't a, a big problem at the, at the moment, but it became one over the next few years. And um, Alex, uh, Chad's, uh, Alex's dad, Chad, decided that he wanted to take me to court for custody of him. During that time, before I'd actually went to court for it, um, my daddy had gotten sick and, you know, we had this really kind of weird relationship and, um, I had been out um, drinking the night before and I was in this custody battle and I was on the phone arguing with Chad the next day about the custody and my dad come upstairs and um, he asked me what was going on. I said I didn't want to talk about it and he grabbed the phone from me and he hit me with the phone and I shoved him and whenever he stepped backwards, he fell down and he broke his hip and whenever he went in for surgery, he passed away. And, I'm sorry, y'all. It's still really hard to talk about that. Um, he passed away, and, and um, about a week later, one of my very, very close friends, Mikey, committed suicide. Um, and then I lost custody of my son maybe a month later. And it kind of spiraled me out into this really dark place. Um, six months later, I was running around with this guy, and he, he had an opiate problem. I hadn't really messed around with opiates at that time. I was just really kind of alcohol and whatever, like Xanax, stuff like that. But um, we went to sleep one night, and uh, when I woke up, he had passed away. He overdosed on uh, morphine. And so I went to treatment for the first time. And I've never, never heard of Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous or, you know, I just, I was, I was scared and I wanted to get away. So I went to treatment. I did not stay sober in the next, and that was in 1999. The next six years of my life, the, the darkness got darker. And you wouldn't think that it could get very much darker, but oh, can it? <laughs> so... I got out of treatment. My mother was diagnosed with leukemia in 2002. July 9th, remember that day, 2002, she passed away. And, um, you know, I just kept sp spiraling out of control. I had gotten into a lot of other types of drugs. I started cooking meth. Anybody ever done that? That's kind of a, that's a weird little world to get into all in itself. You know what I mean? <laughs> like... <laughs> Uh, there's all kinds of people there that aren't really there, and the police are after you often, you know, <laughs> like helicopters, all kinds of stuff. But anyway, um, so um, I also want to say this, in 1997 through 99, I went to college for two years, so don't forget that. I didn't graduate. I didn't graduate, but I went. Um, so the next few years, um, you know, it just got really ugly. And Katrina hit in 2005, which devastated all of New Orleans and anywhere around that's where I live at. Um, and I was living at that time, Alex's grandparents had started to feel really sorry for me. So they let me come live with them. And then Chad's house got destroyed, so he had to move in and I had to move out. Well, I became homeless at that time. So from 2005 to December of 2006, I was homeless. During that time, I got pregnant. 
And um, I'd like to stand up here and tell you that I got sober, but I didn't. And I was really, really scared and I didn't know how to, I didn't know what to do. So I didn't do anything. Um, the only time that really ever applies is in making decisions in Alcoholics Anonymous. When you don't know what to do, you just don't do anything. It doesn't apply whenever you're pregnant and using. <laughs> I didn't go to the doctor. I, did, I, just, I just kept doing drugs. I was hoping that it would just, I don't know, fade away, go away. I don't know. But it didn't. And July 9th. July 9th, 2006, my beautiful daughter was born. And she was healthy. The only thing that was wrong with her, which is not a great thing, but she was addicted. And so she had to stay in the NICU for two weeks and detox off of um, cocaine and amphetamines and um, opiates. And... um. So from, from the time that my mother passed away until now, I developed a very, very serious opiate addiction. And I started shooting up and just really, really, really got deep into some things that um, just really messed up my head and my life and my decision making, as it does for all of us, right? Um, so I had her for six months and I was... Um, given the opportunity to try to fix it. And my thinking was at that time that if I could, you know, pass drug tests, and I was able to do that, um, like Paula said at the women's meeting the other day, we know how to do that. <laughs> and, um, but, you know, my life was unmanageable and I was powerless over alcohol and drugs. And so the end result was, is that I, Got in my car with my daughter one night, and I had persuaded everybody to trust me to take her, you know, off by myself, and I got arrested for aggravated kidnapping, possession with the intent to distribute Schedule II, and use of a controlled dangerous substance in the presence of a child under 17. And my bond was $460,000. And they took her, and they put her in a promise, what they call a promise home, and I'm going to go ahead and tell this part because I always forget to come back to it for some reason. Um, I went to court. That's my sobriety date, December 20th, 2006. And she saved my life. She doesn't know who I am, but she saved my life. I went to jail that night, and I sat in jail for seven months, waiting on court date. And uh, when I got out of jail, they finally dropped all the charges down to, like, lesser charges, and they gave me probation, and um, I got two, I don't know, two or three different felonies from one parish and two felonies from another parish. I'm a two-time convicted felon. And um, I pled guilty to everything, and they gave me probation for five years in two different parishes. And a parish is a county in Louisiana. So <laughs> um, my over the next, when I, I moved into Oxford House, and I'm going to tell this story real quick. I moved into Oxford House. I'm going to come back to that because it's a miracle that I'm here today, y'all. And it was all God. There's no other reason that I'm here today is purely because of God. So after about nine months of going to court, um, it was just really, really killing me. You know what I mean? Like th they were very ugly in court. Um, it was different back then. They didn't really want to give you back your children after you did something like that. So I knew she was in a really good home. Her, um, the 
the man that adopted her, the man and the woman that adopted her, he was a police officer and she was a uh, male lady. And they had, you know, 1.5 kids and, and it was just a really good home for her to go to. And so I made a decision at about nine, nine months out of jail. So I was probably about 18 months sober then to surrender my parental rights and allow her to go and have the life that I couldn't give her at the time. And I still don't, I don't get to see her today. She turned 15 years old this year, July 9th of, 2000, of, of this year, she turned 15 years old. Um, but I know I did the right thing for my daughter. Could I be a mother for her today? Absolutely. I could be a great mother, and, but I think I was a good mother by making the decision because I could barely pay my EES at the Oxford House. <laughs> yeah. So I want to go back to when I got out of jail. I got out of jail and I didn't have anywhere to go, so I hitchhiked from you know, the parish that I had got transported to back to the other parish where I'm from, but Washington Parish. And um, my aunt said, you got one night here. So uh, there were these ladies that come and did the jail ministry at the jail I was in. And they gave, um, they gave me a, like a book or something like that with their name, their, like a phone number to the church. So I called that church and I told them, I'm, I just got out of jail. I don't have nowhere to go. And I don't know where they got the number from because there's no Oxford houses there. They gave me the phone number to Oxford House and Kenner. And I called them. I had no idea what Oxford House was. I just knew if I stayed in Bogalusa, I was going to get high. And so I called and I did a phone interview. Um, well, actually, they couldn't do the phone interview for a few days. So the church ladies come got me. They put me in a little hotel room. And I waited until, the, until Monday to do the phone interview. I think it was like Thursday. Um, so I did the interview. They accepted me. And they told me that it was going to be $400 to move in. And I'm like, I don't have $400. And so the, the, church, the pastor got a fund together from the church to pay my move-in fee and my first two weeks rent to move in. And I'm really passionate about, one, please do the interviews promptly. Don't make people wait because you never know. You never know. They may not. I was lucky. I was lucky those ladies would help me. But there's a many of people out there that won't ever get that opportunity. The other thing is, is sometimes you got to give people a chance that don't have no money. Because if they, if that church wouldn't have been there, I wouldn't be here today. And always do phone interviews. So I got into Oxford House. Um, that's when I met Marty. I went, they, they asked me to go to, the, like, somebody's boyfriend didn't want him to go to the World Convention. And um, they were like, you want to go to Washington, D.C.? I'm like, oh, my God, yes. You know, <laughs> like, I just got out of jail. <laughs> like, <laughs> it was wild. Um, so I lived in Oxford House for seven years, and everything that he told you, I, that was all true. I moved from city to city to city, opened an Oxford house. I worked at the IHOP and I worked at the Waffle House. And so there's always an IHOP and there's always a Waffle House to work at. And that's what I did. I moved all over these little cities in South Louisiana and I opened up Oxford houses. Um, and I loved it. It gave me a purpose. And I didn't think that I could do anything like that. And I remember coming to the World Convention, and I thought it amazed me that we had all these people. It was only like 700 people back then, or maybe even 600. But it amazed me that we could all get together like this and not tear the hotel up. <laughs> I could not believe it. I'm like, they have got to be tearing something up in the hotel. But we, we can. We can get together. We can do this. It was just amazing to me. So in 2010, I got hired on with Oxford House to move to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Now, I'm from New Orleans. And so I get there, and I'm like, where am I? And I was like, OK, y'all, let's go. The girls at my house, Oxford House, green country. I'm like, let's go downtown. It's Friday night, right? We go downtown in Tulsa. It's closed, absolutely closed. It was a great experience, though. I didn't know that, Steve. 
<laughs> it was a great experience, though. You know, it really gave me the opportunity to kind of come into this job and work for Oxford House on my own, you know. And I think that I was able to show everybody that I was capable of doing the job. And, it, you know, it was just a great experience for me. About, oh, I want to tell you about this, too. So remember I told you I went to college in 97 and 98, but I didn't graduate when I lived at the Kenner house for the second time because they messed everything up, um, I decided I'm gonna go back to school. And so I went to get my transcripts. I applied at Southeastern and I went to get my transcripts. And I went to the college that I attended and they gave me a copy of my degree. And I'm like, I didn't, I didn't graduate. And they said, oh, back in 2001, they dropped the amount of hours you had to have to earn that degree and then they sent diplomas out to everybody and I in 2001 I was like all messed up so I was a college graduate for eight years and I did not know <laughs> I have an associate's degree in marketing and management <laughs> and Marty threw a graduation party and got and he, got, he threw me a graduation party and got me a cap and gown and everything it was it was the Oxford House graduation of the year and it wasn't even from drug court, you know? It was so awesome. So I moved back to Louisiana, and um, a, a, a year or so later, I was um, promoted to regional manager over Louisiana and Mississippi. Um, one of the biggest things I want to to tell you all that God is the first and foremost, most important thing in my life, my relationship with God. And I was able to gain that relationship through the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I still practice my 12 step program on a regular basis. I have one of my sponsees is here, Lindsay, Lindsay G. <laughs> um, I, I still sponsor women. Um, I still go to meetings. And, you know, it, it really helps me to deal with, I really, it's, it's not recommended to, to work for Oxford House if you don't have some sort of program. Um, because you will go crazy. <laughs> and you might get high, so don't do that. Um, it's really important to work a program of recovery. You know, um, we're messed up in the head and sometimes we need that help, you know, that spiritual help, that help through other people to be able to get in line with what, what reality is, right? Because our perception is skewed because we're addicts or alcoholics. Um, I want to talk a little bit um, about my life today. So about five years ago, um, I was... I'm always, like, I was always the worst person about picking a guy. Like, I've been through, I don't, it was just terrible. I'm, I picked the wrong relationships, and I, I always get into trouble behind men. Um, well, about, about five years ago, I finally turned that part of my life over to God, and I met who is now today my husband. I didn't meet him. I've known him since I was 18. Um, but he's very different from anyone I've ever dated. Um, we got married in, uh, uh, last year, October, we got married on Halloween last year in 2020. <laughs> but my husband is a police officer. <laughs> and not only, like, he just graduated in 2019, he, he graduated from the FBI National Academy. And so it's like this prestigious school that people, go, that cops go to, to further their education. But it's at Quantico here in, in Virginia. <laughs> and I found myself, now me, like I'm just like a street junkie, you know, <laughs> like at um, the FBI, I can't, you know, FBI headquarters in Quantico with the FBI director. I can't remember his name, but... Like, what are the chances of that? That's absolutely insane. Um, my husband is a wonderful man. 
He loves Oxford House. He is so 100% supportive of recovery. He could not be here. He had to stay home and work because of the hurricane. So what we all get to go home to tomorrow and Monday in Louisiana is no power, no water. <laughs> it's, it's rough down there right now. We got to clean up a lot. So please keep everybody in Louisiana in your prayers. Um, but the funny thing about my husband is he's known me since I was 18. So he's known everything, everything, including he used to come pick up people for transport when I was in jail. And that is amazing to me. Like he really loves me for exactly who I am, you know, <laughs> and exactly where I came from. Um, my son is a, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful son. He's 26 years old. He has, his personality is very much like mine. He's very bubbly, outgoing. He likes to laugh a lot. And we have an absolute wonderful relationship today. Um, he, he texts me the other day. He's like, mom, and he makes a good bit of money. Probably like he works in like he, he, he does the operator. He's an operator for big machinery. So he makes pretty good money, right? And he calls me the other day and he's like, mom, how come I won't ever have no money? So I'm like, well, send me your bank statements. Oh my God. Just constantly buying Chick-fil-A and food. I, you know, I'm like, look, I'll teach you how to do it, but you got to apply it. Like, this is what I do. I teach people how to do this at work, you know? <laughs> I don't know if he's going to listen to me or not, but we, I will try. <laughs> um, I don't know my daughter. I don't, I don't get to know her. Um, but I do know this, that I believe that I will be her friend one day. And if I don't get to be your friend, <laughs> that means that she was loved enough. And that is what I want for her. I want her to be loved enough. <laughs> Oxford House, my best friends at this table right here. <laughs> Kathleen, they taught me what real love is. They taught me love. My name is Lori, I'm an alcoholic. Thank you all so much. Let's give her another round of applause. Absolute amazing strength, courage, and a role model for so many women. Um, it's truly a pleasure to work with Lori. <laughs> 